Well, good day and welcome to yet another Caribbean Praise with myself, Grantly. It's good to have your company today. This is going to be a two-parter because uh, my guest has so much information that we need to share and get across. We can't do it in one part, so um, please bear with us. You're going to enjoy today's interview. It's probably going to be the most in-depth interview that I've ever done for any platform and Believe me, I've done quite a few interviews in my time. So my guest today um, was born in 1946 and he hails from um, Newmarket in St. Elizabeth. Um, he hails from a strong Christian family. His father, Thomas Senior, a uh, Methodist preacher, his mother, Alice. Uh, and this union, union produced nine boys and two girls. My guest is one of the boys, obviously. And... Um, he has worked with some of the biggest names in the reggae music industry in Jamaica and around the world. He has produced, he has a number of businesses, he has so much knowledge that he has um, been awarded so many awards that if I was to get into the awards, it'd probably take me a good 15, 20 minutes to call them all out. But let's, <laughs> let's say this. So from the year 1987 to uh, 2021, he has received a huge amount of award, awards. Uh, and some of you are wondering, who am I talking about? I am talking about the one and only Dr. Thomas Cohen, better known as Tommy Cohen. Good day to you, sir. Bless you, brother Grantly. It's, um, <laughs> it's good to see you. A, a privilege to be here and um, to be sharing with you and your audience today. Oh, thank so you so much, be... Tommy. God bless you, sir. Yeah. You, you, you do so many things, and I totally understand how busy you are. So, thank you so much for taking time out um, for us to do this two-part interview. Um, we, we're going to relax. We're not going to rush to. We're not going to rush into this. We've got plenty of time to do part one. <laughs> part two, and um, really cover some ground. Because I, 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 for many years, Tommy, I've been following um, what you do. And, um, you know, you've been around, should we say, a little longer than I. <laughs> should we put it that way? You've been around for a while. Um, but, yeah, from, from the early 60s or mid-60s, you have impacted the world. You have impacted the world in terms of, um, you know, the groups that you've been a part of the music that you have produced, the events that you've arranged, um, the people that you have worked with over the years. And um, I, I think it's only right that we honour you um, in this way. And so um, today, that's what we aim to do. Um, so, Tommy, can we just start off by um, you telling us a little bit about yourself, the early days, the early days, early, early days. Get, let's get into that first of all. Um, yes. You were born in um, Jamaica, and yes, you grew up in St. Elizabeth, but you didn't stay there, did you? No. Um, actually, very interesting, though, um, because you mentioned it, that my father was um, a, what we call a lay preacher yes. at the Methodist Church, and he, um, he actually was at Newmarket Methodist Church for probably 60 years. And... Um, that's where I first heard the word of God. And of course, growing up in our house, we, we just thought that this was just how life is. It was just about God and his goodness and how um, he, um, he guide us and protect us and we lived accordingly, um, amazingly. I think when I look back at it, um, my early upbringings, and some of the things that happened to me very early because I, I left Newmarket very early mm. and um, went to Kingston. Um, but as I recall, one of, the, one of the amazing things, and it took me years after going back to Newmarket to realize that one Sunday morning on my way to church, my, the church was on a hill. And then we as kids, we never actually wore shoes we, we actually carry the shoes that we have in our hand because we didn't want it to be worn out. And then when we reached close to church, 
he would put on the shoes, wipe off our foot with the grass or whatever. And as I took a shortcut, um, Grantly, to, to go to the church, and I was climbing up this little hill, yeah. there's a tree called a trumpet tree. And what happened, that trumpet tree burst. Um, if, if you know what a trumpet tree is, it's hollow inside. Yes. But that, that tree burst and water came out of that tree and wet me all up. And um, I didn't think much of it as a child, but that was my original baptism. Then, then the tree closed up back and it had on it what was looked like a, a sore coming yeah. down the, the side of the tree. And, um, and I went back um, very recently and trumpet trees are still there. And as a matter of fact, there was like three trumpet trees standing out, almost like Jesus on the cross there, with the three trees, the three um, crosses on that hillside. Um, but that was my early upbringing. Uh, my father, we never knew, even though nine boys and two girls living in two, um, actually two, two bedrooms, we never even understand that we were poor because my father, you know, sometimes I would hear people talk about how oh, what they came out of her, what the abuse and all of that. I never really had abuse in my home. Um, I've never really had this dramatic thing of being saved from some um, amazing evil because even it took me years to understand that we only had meat once a week and everything else we thought well god was just providing whether we were having the the um the fruits from the trees or having the bread fruit and just having it with some salt on it we just thought this was just the greatest thing when i came to kingston for the first time i knew something was different because <laughs> the first kid i never forget him his name was dennis rainford and he came across to where i was at delacree road and he kept looking down at my feet. And um, I had on shoes, but the shoes were so big yeah. because we would have, the shoes would have to last us. So we'd, and so we'd have to grow into the shoes. And it took me years after to realize, oh, there's such a thing as a flushing toilet, running water yep. and all of that. But we still grew up and thinking that God, you are amazing. Absolutely. So my father, used to make sure that there was always, when we ran out of bread, we didn't know that we were running out of bread, but my father said, you can't touch the bread in the bread basket. It was hung in the, the ceiling of the house because, you know, bread must always be in the basket. So <laughs> we grew up with, with the love of God so much and it's so amazing that we just, up to this day, we can't do anything else but give thanks. Amen, amen. Um, those were the early days, and you know, we never. The, the Bible tells us that we should never, um, you know, we should never forget our our beginning, our humble beginning. God has taken you a long way, um, but yeah, yeah, back then you attended um, halfway tree primary school. Yes, early days, and then you went on to college as well. Yeah, on to Walgrove College. I attended um, halfway tree primary school um uh for, for for some years um yeah we'd walk to school and it was i must say really an amazing time because just the friends meeting new people getting to understand what a city life was like what their food was like um and um and and still not getting out of hand of um we we just never got too materialistic still you know, even though we saw these things happening around. And then, you know, the rest of it is history in the sense of um, where it led me to, to, to build that platform and that foundation, um, which I developed, I guess, my whole musical career and involvement started right there in Harper Tree School, right there singing during the class times or at, um, when they have concerts, and then we, we just grew out of that. Yeah. Early days. So um, 
out of that, you 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 then you know you just described how you um, you sang, um, but you joined a group, um, a vocal group um, that wasn't Yet. well. They weren't well known until t- until you changed your name. But tell us the early days of of joining that group. How did it all come about, and what was the name that you started out with? Okay, um, this this story is like at halfway through school. Um, I was doing like little concerts mm-hmm. and then I went on to Walgrove College, which was a private college because I did not get into any of the renowned high schools, but Walgrove College was a renowned school. And um, so I, I got into Walgrove College and so one day while um, there was a concert at a high school called St. Hughes High School. Um, I went over there to participate because that invited me to sing at a concert they were having at the school. So I sang a song by Pat Boone called Be Faithful Darling, you know? And um, so after the concert, yeah. a set of guys came over to me and said, hey, what's your name? You know, you um, you want to you want to join our group? I said, why you want me to join the group? They said, because the girls like you. <laughs> so, oh, dear. It's, not, it's not the words. It's not because you can sing. Not because you can sing, but the girls like you. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to listen to them, and they, they offered to sing, and they um they told me the name of the group was called the Miracles. The Miracles. And, yeah, the Miracles. M E R R I C O L E S. With guys like I Kong Norris, we are Martin Williams, and a guy now named Derek Brown. So it was a big group. And uh, we started singing as the Miracles. And we had engagements at different um, talent contests and um, nightclubs and things like this. These were back in the days when Jamaican music was, uh, it was during that period of the early 60s. And when you go to sing at a nightclub, yeah. or you had to wait until late times in the morning before you sing in yeah. some of the clubs, they, they wait until the people stop buying the drinks. Then they, for them to buy more drinks, they put you on to sing. So I, I joined the Miracles and we, we got to get around with a few of the, the bands of the time, Tommy McCook and the Scatterlights, the Soul Vendors, um, um, Sammy Isme and his group. And one day, um, while we were, were singing, we were asked to serenade. Yeah. We knew a girl called, called Jackie. And um, actually, Jackie, still a friend of ours. Jackie happens to be Muta Baruka's wife right now. Huh? And her mother, yeah, <laughs> her mother was being dated by a guy called Aston McEachran, who was considered a very rich American. So we were asked to serenade, go by their home and serenade the, um, the couple while they were having dinner. Sounds like a scene so, out of a movie. <laughs> yeah, we were, they were singing and we were quite young. They wouldn't even give us a beer to drink, you know. They gave us a thing called Shandy, which was a beer mixed with a soda. <laughs> okay, good um, lemonade. Mostly cream soda. Yeah. So um, we sang while the couple sang, sat and ate. And when he was finished, that was when he said, boys, I shall give you a shandy to drink. You would never drink anything strong than a shandy. So then he sat us down and he said, boys, I have something to say to you. He said, you should change your name. I said, what? He says, yes, change the name of the group. He says, yes. And what would you want to change? You should change it as. He says, you should call yourself the Jamaicans. Wow. We thought that was like, wow, how could you change from a beautiful name 
to a common name like the Jamaicans. Everybody's a Jamaican, you know? And he said, listen to me. Listen to me. One day, this music that you're doing is going to become famous all over the world. And it's going to be known as the music coming from Jamaica. And you, want to, you will be the first to be identified with it. Call yourself the Jamaicans. And that is history. Certainly As you know, is. the Jamaicans, um, he promised, of course, to take us on the Ed Sullivan show. That never happened. But um, we, we went on to, to make songs like Woman Go Home, um, Jamaica. Um, and, of course, we did the 1960s. The festival six, song, um, yeah? The big festival yeah, song. Yeah, 67 festival song, Baba Boom Time. Mm. And... Um, who took, the, like, who took the lead on that, Tommy? We'll get to the other song. Who took the lead on, on that, on that, uh, no, on that Norris song? Weir. Norris, Norris Weir. Dr. Norris Weir. Yeah. He took the right. lead on it. My goodness, yeah. his vocals are just so on point. I mean, to this day, oh, yeah. the, to this yeah. day, to this very day, right, Tommy, it's one of those songs that when you play it, it it's like timeless. It's timeless. Yes. Not only did it win the festival... Um, the year 1967, but it also charted in Jamaica as well, right? Oh, yes. And it's been, um, I can't remember, there's even a group who has done it over called Gueve, G-U-A-V-E, and um, something. And the people post it a lot and sent a lot to me. I mean, it's just been amazing, amazing. Um, so what really happened at that time yeah. I realized in um, the talents of, of Norris, and we, we, we wrote songs together. Did and, you write um, Baga Boom Time together? Yes, we did write Baba Boom Time together. Okay. And we also wrote Things You Say You Love You're Gonna Lose, which UB40 sold, like, I guess, millions of copies millions. of Millions. Millions. Yeah. You, you, um, must send and, them a, and, you must send them a Christmas card every year. Oh man, Ali, <laughs> Ali man, they're my good friends because that was what Big up Ali out of you before that then. royalty yeah, that yeah, I received yeah, yeah. out of music. My goodness, that's I'm a bit like that's a bit like that kind of reminds me, Tommy. I'm sorry to cut you. That kind of reminds me of Dolly Parton and um, Whitney Houston saving all my love for um, for me. You know, when when Dolly wrote the song, Whitney sang the song. Uh, and it just blew up. I mean, my God. Yeah. My God. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. so that song, yeah. that song did very well to the point where UB40 re recorded the song. They re recorded yeah. the song. That blew up again. But my goodness, the original. So, those two songs that we just, we just mentioned, we just mentioned two song titles out of quite a few many that you guys did. But those two were in the kind of like late 60s, 67, et cetera. Uh, recorded on the Treasure Isle label, which yeah. everybody should know. That's the Honourable Duke Reed. Yes. Now, Duke Duke has got a legendary, um, how can we put it? He, he was known as a guy that was, you know, like toting his gun on his hip. You know, he, he wasn't scared to let off shots. How did you meet Duke <laughs> Reed? How did you meet Duke Creed to record those songs? <laughs> oh gosh. We we were we we first went to, to Coxon. You went Coxon, we Clement Dodd first, yeah? Yeah, we were Clement Dodd and we did a couple of songs. And then um but then we 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 heard of, of Duke and we thought to ourselves, well, that time there was a kind of a split in the scatterlights. Okay. Where they were having um, a split, some of the musicians. Bit of a riff going on, yeah? Okay. Yeah. All right. And, um, and so one of the musicians, uh, I think, said to us, come down at, by Duke Reed and, um, because we guys going to be there. And um, scatterlights had just gotten Jackie Jackson Okay. As a bass player. Nice. And we were hearing of this young bass player, mm. you know, kind of like 
more like sounding like a Robbie Shakespeare. Robbie yeah. wasn't around yet. He was, he was the but Robbie like that, Shakespeare of the day, right. of that day. <laughs> yeah. And, and we, we went there. So yeah. now, when you go to Duke Reed, you, you understand, you get the vibe. He's Charles Street, right? And the four corners of Charles Street, he would put down his drinks because he had a, a wine drink distribution center company. Wow. And his drinks were on the street side, on the four corners. And that gives you the first signal that no man can steal his stuff. So that's the first <laughs> vibe you get. Okay. All right. This is no joking. This is no so, joking. <laughs> right. So when we when we heard of what and, and saw what was happening, we made sure that we we rehearse. We rehearse very well because no way you're gonna face the Duke with any second class thing, you know, you have to be well prepared. So we rehearsed, I remember, we rehearsed, um, and then we went down to Duke. So when you go down to Duke, you don't see the Duke. You meet a guy called Cottins, and there was also, um, um, what's his name, King Sporty. Okay. And, and Cottins, King Sporty, I don't know if you know who King Sporty is, he was the one who I think wrote Buffalo Soldier for Bob Marley. Oh, oh right. But, okay. Yeah, King Sport. King Sport. Right. Right. And yeah, he, ah, uh, gosh, he was married to some famous, famous American singer. We'll come back. But um, so you go and they look at you from outside, and there's a little door um, cut out. Yeah. Back into a door, a little door in a door. Right. And you creep under that door right uh -huh. and you 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 meet cuttings okay and you you open your mouth and you sing for cuttings right and then cuttings pass you when when cuttings pass you they send you upstairs and when you go upstairs you see this heavy set man and he had some Bullets across the ammunition chest. strap across his chest, yeah. Ammunition <laughs> strap, you call it. He had his um, he had his revolver uh -huh. in his holster, uh -huh. right? And um, he took a little white room and he wipe over his face, and um, and he says, "Sing," and then you sing, and he says, "Go." and record so we had gone there and sing there was a song before that that we did um can't really remember but we sang that one and then um we did things you say you think you're say. gonna lose yeah big big song and tommy then, big song big song yeah. things you say yeah, you're man. gonna lose my then, goodness, to this day. Uh, carry on with the yeah. story. Carry on. Yeah. And so he he kind of taught me also mm -hmm. how to do promotions. Okay. So he's, he gave me the record and sent me to meet a guy at RJR. Okay. Radio, to Radio Station. To uh -huh. Right. So you turned into a plugger now. <laughs> right. And in the night... I went into a club and I met a guy, Dennis Thompson, who became the engineer of Bob Marley. And he played the song and I saw people dancing to it. And I was like too satisfied because at the time I thought maybe the vocals could have been high, higher, but they knew what they were doing. And so things you say, um, we, we started out and that song made up quite an impression and um after that we entered the the festival song but well, we have been entering the festival song competition before because what really happened before 1966 which was bamba 
1965, they had what is called the Pop and Mentor Competition. Okay. And we won it. Wow. And then again, the, in 1966, they decided to split. I think we, 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 we won it with a song called Waited So Long, which was a song that I think we probably did for Coxon. Right. Waited So Long. And then the next year, they decided they wanted to have a, a song competition. Mm -hmm. um, and then we thought, well, wow. And then they were still having the, the performance side. And, and because we would be choreographed and all of that, and our outfit and all of that used to be really catchy, we decided we would go into the, to the, um, the, the performance side of it. And we won the performance side of it and touched one with Bam Bam. Okay. And then 67 now, we, um, we decided to enter the competition. And we went to, to Duke Reed. Um, we entered the competition, got selected, and Duke Reed decided to record the song with us. And of course, that was real competition because if you should look back and I, you know, just recently I see on YouTube, the, the poster of the year with yes. Alan the Vibrators, Desmond Deck and the Aces, Toots. Um, <laughs> Toots and the Maytals. Uh, not Toots because Toots was in jail actually that day. Okay. But the Maytals were yes. on. Uh -huh. um, and I think we had Monty Morris. Uh -huh. was in that competition. Um, but it was, and I think Derek Hyrat and maybe, maybe, um, maybe, um, I'm not sure if Derek Morgan, but that lineup was. The lineup, amazing. tremendous. Tremendous lineup. And, yeah, the competition was because um, behind Baba Boom, Unity. U N I T Y a unity. unity. That's an amazing song. <laughs> Big song. And, Huge. And um, Alan the Vibrators move up Jamaica. So yeah. the competition, and it was the public you know, who was voting at that time. There was not the judges. You used to actually like an election. People had to, to mark a ballot and vote for the uh, for the competition. Okay. And Baba Boo. Okay. Yeah, came out. Run time. away with it. Bag of boom time. Like, just run away with it. 1967. Just tore up the place. Um and yeah. it was known it was known throughout the whole world. Throughout the whole world. And to this yes. day, that song, don't care how you play that song. The start of the song. That that uh, uh, Whose idea was that, Tommy? That was brilliant. Yes. Whose idea was that? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Everybody get ready. the rock It's Baba. You and that. Oh my gosh. Absolutely just. To Actually, this day. I've been asked to come and, and sing that song for the for the um, Jamaican diaspora in August in New York City, and to be given a citation from the the mayor for that contribution of that song. You yeah. know what? I am and not Morrison surprised. Morrison himself wrote it. You know, in those days, Grantly, you had to decide, and people are a little bit confused even up to this day. Mm -hmm. You had to decide who was the lead singer and who was the leader. Yes. Of, because it was a time of groups. Remember in that time, the Maytals, the, the Heptones, Tons. yeah, the um, Clarendonians, the Melodians, the name it. And America had the Drifters, the Platters, you know. Um, so The Drifters, Temptations. It was all about groups back in yeah. them days. Huh? It was all about groups back in them days. Yes, man. All about groups. The Paragons. Because a lot of folks even mixed us up with the Paragons at some time. Because people are always in um, competition betting. Who did um, things you say love you're going to lose? And a lot of people thought it was the Paragons at the time. 
Yeah. That was the group that um, spawned um, John Holt, right? The Paragons. John Holt and Bob Andy. And Bob Andy as well. There you Bob go. Bob Andy was actually in that group. That so band. big, big times back then, um, Tommy. Huge times. You know, you won festival songs and, you know, you're producing with the two biggest producers on the island, uh, Clements Dodd for Studio One and Duke Reed for Treasure Isle. Um, what came next after all of that? Because, I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure you must have been thinking to yourself, how are we going to top this? What came next? <laughs> well, we did we did quite a bit of songs. Um, Sing Freedom. Um, we did uh, Peace and Love. Um, and we did, we did quite a bit of songs because, as a matter of fact, there's, a, there's an album out with the Jamaicans doing like 22 songs on that album um, called Now and Then. Um, but what happened after that yeah. is that different members started to go different ways. And um, even Norris himself had moved to the United States. And I, I kind of stayed in Jamaica. I, I really never left and got more involved in um, in the music industry, I let me see now. I I joined Byron Lee and started his organization called Dynamic Sounds. Yes, um, and we built Dynamic Sounds, and then uh, but Dynamic Sounds, of course, you know, we developed quite a bit of artists. Um, as a matter of fact. I produced a song called Cherry O' Baby. Now, everybody song. knows that song. Everybody yeah. knows Oh Cherry O' oh, yeah. Cherry O' Baby. Huge song. Huge. You actually yeah. produced that song? I produced that song. Okay. I was the producer of that song with my band called the Inner Circle. Because okay. the Inner Circle was also my group. And um, we produced Cherry O' Baby. But we had other... Artists such as Keith Lynn, Vic Taylor, Ken Lazarus, um, Adina Edwards, who are blind singer that we took off the streets of of, um, of Kingston and recorded her. And she had a number one song called Don't Forget to Remember. Um, and, um, and, you know, we had Barry Biggs and all of that. Some of those guys are known, well known in England. Most definitely. Uh, Barry Barry Biggs, he did a Wide Awake in a Dream. And um, right. it was a national hit, pop chart hit as well. Right. Yeah. So, right. yeah, you worked with some big artists even back then. Yeah. And even Boris Gardner was there with us too. Yeah. Um, you know, remember, and he's big in England too. I want to wake up with you. Exactly. But, big um, song. And then I decided that I. I wanted to make a, a contribution very consciously in my mind uh, to, to forward the Jamaican artists because I thought there was something more in the Jamaican artists than what we were seeing. And um, because those days, like, okay, we would do a lot of tours around Jamaica. You go on stage, you do two songs, and if the crowd likes you, you do a third song. And Byron Lee did do quite a bit of touring around Jamaica, especially during the, the months of of January, you know, when they used to call it, um, they call it, call it mango season. I mean, mm. In other words, everybody spent out their money in Christmas and there was no money in January. Where was he going, you know, yeah. with these shows? But all of them were packed because nothing else was happening. Nothing else was happening. But yeah, the shows. captive so audience. Yeah, yeah the man, the Blues Indian. Busters, if you remember the Blues Busters, yeah. and Roy Shirley and um, Alton Ellis, and, um, oh man, the list goes on. Dennis Brown, uh, later years, was just a child star, like at nine years old, and all of this. And we would tour Master Griffiths, yeah, young girl out there, and we, we, we toured the island. And then... I was the marketing manager there at Dynamic Sounds. Um, so you were you were learning you were learning your craft even back then, um, oh, Tommy. You oh, were learning yes. the craft. Oh, yeah. That's a, it was you yeah. were setting up yourself to to for what you're currently doing right now, right? 
Oh, yes, yes, because I got a first hand on production because he was a, the best produced band on stage, sound wise, um, discipline wise, and um, um, and recording. And we had a recording studio. So, and being the marketing manager, I was marketing manager and doing labels like Atlantic and Motown and um, and Polygram and, and these different labels. Atco. And of course, so I'm getting a first hand and Otis Redding, um, Benny King, the Drifters, Aretha Franklin, Michael Jackson, the Jackson Five, of course, no Michael, and, and you know, the, the four tops, name it. I mean, we were just, I was just being exposed to all of this. And then I decided I wanted to make my contribution to the growth of Jamaican music. And it was hard enough for me to go to Byron and say, I want to leave yeah. to start my company. Yeah. We're gonna um, we're gonna we're gonna actually leave and, and leave this as part one right now because I think yes. this is I think this is a good time for us to take a break. Let you refresh your, your, your tonsils. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, because um you know, we did say that we'd do part one and two. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank yeah. you so much, Tommy. I know we've got so much more to cover. So um, do look out for part um, part two. That's coming your way real soon. Uh, but for now, Grant Lee, on the Caribbean praise, saying thank you for uh, stopping by this way. Uh, look out for part two. It's coming real soon. Real, real soon. Ah!